Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for our class's final presentation, Two Worlds, Immigrant Experiences, Journeys, and Perspectives. Uh, over the course of the semester, we've been focusing on immigrant groups in the Twin Cities, uh, specifically the non Latino and Somali groups. Uh, we had service learning and intensive interviewing be kind of the focuses of the ways that we learned about these groups. And we decided to present this afternoon from the uh, perspective of the immigrant experience itself. The three places that our students volunteered were the Waite House, the Franklin Learning Center, both in Minneapolis and Jackson Elementary in East St. Paul in the Frog Town neighborhood. And the other half of the class did intensive interviews, which you'll hear a little bit about later. And all of us participated in examining the sociological literature about immigration, uh, both nationally and specifically in Minneapolis and Minnesota. So thank you again for joining us. And please join me in welcoming Karina and Sarah to talk about some myths about immigration and the facts that we've used to debunk them over the course of these last four months. start with some common myths about immigration and immigrants. With the research we did, we're going to debunk these myths, and we specifically chose these three because they relate with the research we did the most. To show how these are reinforced in our society, I took some quotes from a couple of articles and a political cartoon. So the first myth is that most immigrants come to the U.S. for economic motives. So this is a quote I found from the first article. A large share of the illegal alien population is generally accepted as being in the workforce because that is what motivates illegal immigration. However, there are some family members, especially children of illegal aliens, not in the labor force, while others may be in prison. As you can see, this quote supports the myth that the sole reason immigrant, immigrants come to the United States is for economic motives, and Sarah is going to show us how that's not true. So the second myth about immigration is that immigration hurts the economy. So I found this article that stated 18 facts of reasons why immigrants hurt the economy. These facts were stated without any type of research or data, and I will read two of the facts of the list. The first one was, illegal immigrants generally don't pay taxes. The vast majority of illegal aliens would never even dream of paying income taxes. But Mexicans living in America send billions upon billions of dollars out of the United States and back to Mexico every single year. The second one, or the second fact, was although illegal aliens pay next to nothing in taxes, they have no problem receiving tens of billions of dollars worth of free education, benefits, free health care benefits, free housing assistance, and free food stamp benefits. Many communities in the United States now openly advertise that they will help illegal aliens with these as I said before, these facts had no research or data to support them. However, a lot of people take these things to be true because they are so reinforced in our society. And Sarah's going to prove that these facts are wrong. Okay. So if you go to page two of your handout, it actually has this table. And it's pretty good, so you need to get your little bit closer. Um, you can see that the percentage, as the percentage of immigrants in the labor force increases. So here I'm looking at this particular column. Um, so does the economic growth of a metro area. So for example, Minneapolis happens to be located right here. 
from immigrants coming here to our city. Some other facts that sort of debunk this myth include that um, the United States net gain from immigration is $37 million per year. And that's a huge amount and a huge impact. In Minnesota, in the year 2000, immigrant-owned businesses generated $331 million in net income. And that was just in the year 2000. And so we can almost assume that the impact has been a lot greater since then. And finally, if immigrants were removed from the labor force in Minnesota, Minnesota would lose over 24,000 permanent jobs and $1.2 billion in personal income. And that, again, is a huge amount. And this was all done, um, all of this data was gathered from a study done through the Northwest Area Foundation and the Humphrey Institute in the, at the University of Minneapolis, Minnesota, excuse me. And so you can see that there's been a lot of research done about this. And the fact of the matter is, is that immigration and economic growth going in in hand, and immigrants are more likely to move to areas where there are jobs available and will avoid areas where jobs are not. And then the last myth is that immigrants don't want to learn English. As you can see in this political cartoon, it supports that, that myth, and this goes to show how pervasive, pervasive these misconceptions are in our society. However, Sarah will again show us how this is not. So finally, this graph is also on the second page of your handout. Um, I do want to note that I realize that this is only primarily focusing on the Latino population. Um, so there is more research to be found in terms of language <coughs> acquisition, um, but for this presentation purpose, I'll use this graph. Um, so here we can see that, yes, there are a lot of generational differences in the acquisition, acquisition excuse me, of the English language. And yes, we can see here that the first generation typically do, does not speak that much English. However, we can see here that in the second and third or later generation, that percentage increases. And so by the second generation, the majority of immigrants are speaking fluent English, and they're actually beginning to lose fluency in their native languages. So that kind of goes against the whole idea that immigrants refuse to learn English or don't want to learn English. And finally, something else that I want to note is that immigrants who come to the United States are typically connected with a variety of different community organizations like the Brian Coyle Center or the Lutheran Social Services. And these organizations offer a lot of English learning classes for those individuals. And so it gives them a lot of access to resources. <laughs> And um, children who aren't able to enroll into those adult classes are enrolled into English language learning programs in their schools. And so we know that there are abundance of resources available to immigrants and their children. So all in all, choosing to not learn English is a decision that very few immigrants actually make. So now we will turn it over to Courtney, who will discuss the sociological research that has been done on immigration. Power between generations. 
Immigrants and boomers analyzed California's demographic transition as an example for the rest of the U.S. He proposed an intergenerational social contract that acknowledges the cycle of roles everyone goes through and argues that the baby boomers are retiring and we need to invest in a workforce to replace them. Humanism and Horowitz found that immigration can produce dramatic shifts in the ethno-racial encoding of achievement. In Cupertino, California, high-skilled Asian immigrants have enforced amplified high achievement norms, which means that Asians have come to be associated with high achievement and hard work, while whites have come to be associated with people that are lazy and mediocre. In contrast, Generations of Exclusion updated a 1965 study of life experiences of Mexican Americans. In 2000, they interviewed the original participants, along with their children, and found that, as Karina and Sarah said, in language, they assimilate quite well. Financial and educational attainment, however, peaked in the second generation. Ethnic boundaries and racialization reinforced in groups and out groups, and institutional barriers have kept them at a disadvantage. In a 2013 study, Morando interviewed upwardly mobile young second generation Mexicans to find what they had in common. And those that were interviewed cited three most common resources parental support advice and guidance for mentors outside the family, and bilingualism in English and Spanish. The book Deflecting Immigration examined the way that networks, markets, and regulation in LA impacted the way immigrants were rendered invisible when they were useful to the economy. Then, when the economy worsened, they were perceived as problematic and pushed out through institutionalized discrimination. And finally, in 2013, Sohoni found that the public links immigrants and crime, despite a lot of evidence to the contrary, and create boundaries in that way. Undocumented is code for illegal, and the terms are conflated so that Hispanic implies illegal. In sum, this research presents a picture of U.S. immigrants as facing multiple factors of systemic discrimination. Race, ethnicity, socioeconomic class, and legal status. And that these barriers and their accompanying labels make it difficult for them to be incorporated into our society. It's also relevant to notice that the vast majority of this recent research on immigration focuses only on the Latino population. Only two of the above sources I mentioned focus on other populations who immigrate here. We hope our research contributes to this gap. And now I'd like to introduce Ashley, Quila, Duina, Segal, and Mal, who will present the immigrant experience as reflected in our interviews. Okay, so as Mason mentioned earlier, about half of our class um, did intensive interviewing on the three immigrant populations. Um, so intensive interviewing is a qualitative research method. It aims for more of a conversational approach. And as a class, we formulated interview questions. These were used only as a guide, however, because inter intensive interviewing is relatively unstructured. This allows flexibility to take the interview in many different ways. The interviews that were completed were approximately one hour long. These were then transcribed and coded for further analysis. Approximately 19 interviews were completed within our group. Um, they were completed using convenient and snowball sampling. Convenient in that we used um, participants that were available and willing to be interviewed. And snowball in that we got referrals for people that were interested in being interviewed. Unfortunately, um, since it was only 19 interviews, this does limit the generalizability. So I'm going to give descriptive statistics of the population that we did interview, and I can't speak for immigration as a whole. So the three immigrant groups, as previously mentioned, are Hmong, Somali, and Latino. For identifying culture, you'll see that it says hyphenated American. And all this means is um, the people that we interviewed decided to um, classify or identify their culture as Hmong American, Somali American, Latino American, et cetera. Whereas non-hyphenated American, um, they prefer not to use that hyphenated American at the end. Um, the majority of our interviewees were female. Age range from about 16 to 34 years old. For the immigrant generation, um, first generation are those who are born in their native country and then came to the United States. Second generation are those who are born here in the United States. And then you also notice that there's generation 1.5 on there, and we actually added that category because a lot of the interviewees were born in their native country but then came here at a young age and so they really grew up in the United States and they identified more with the second generation. So we created um, generation 1.5. You'll see the age range of when they left their home countries ranging from two years old to 27. The amount of time here, less than a year, all the way to 28 years. And then the last one is settlement. So the majority of the interviews that we um, interviewed, um, they ended here in the Twin Cities, 
um, nearly 70%, and that was in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. And only about half of them experienced movement. And what we mean by that is they came to the United States and then they bounced from different places before finally settling, whether in the Twin Cities or other areas. And now I'm going to turn it over to Quila, who will be talking about the perceptions of self pertaining to the uh, immigrants that we interviewed.
to me, it, it really, really grabs my attention. Um, so for the adults, specifically first-generation immigrants in the United States, um, they face a lot greater challenges uh, because it was their first time in the United States. Um, they had the language barrier of not knowing English as a language in general. Um, they also had a very, very hard time navigating through the systems in the United States, whether that was politically, socially, educationally. Um, and they also felt greater, uh, they also went through greater challenges with education um, because they were not familiar with the way that everything worked in the United States educationally. And I have two quotes here, one from the Somali population and one from the Latino population. Uh, from the Somali. My mom was the only person who could actually bring in income with the help of the welfare services. It was extremely difficult for my mom to settle in the U.S., Latino population. My mom would try to go into school here, but would end up dropping out. She did this a couple of times, but she could never pass because she barely knew how to read, write, or even speak English. The second pattern that we noticed when it came to the generational variations was uh, this dependency on future generations to succeed. Um, this was a very, very, very common thing that we saw, especially with 1.5 uh, uh, people that we interviewed and second generation um, students that we interviewed. And this has to do more because of assimilation. These generations have tended uh, to assimilate more to a U.S. culture and have an easier time navigating through the systems of the United States. Um, it also came because they were challenging cultural norms uh, within their own cultures, which helped them actually to succeed more. Um, and then, of course, the education barrier where they actually have an education in the United States so they can uh, further their uh, succession. There was no language barrier, and then there was a tendency of seeing a power shift between the second generation and this need to uphold the family honor, family financially, or just a stable just in general. Uh, so I end with this quote that was very powerful and really, uh, really kind of encapsulates this uh, dependency of future generations to succeed. Anything could happen and they could get deported at any moment. I have two little brothers and I would have to take care of them. I have a lot of pressure on me to be an example for my brothers and also a lot of pressure to have a better life than my parents did. They tell me that once I graduate and I have a stable job, I will be supporting my two younger brothers through college. My parents don't want me to struggle like they did, and they want me to succeed, and there are no room for me to make mistakes. Now I will turn it over to Sigal, where she will be talking about the immigrants' political perspective. Thank you, Davina. I will be talking about immigration as a political issue from the immigrants' perspective. I would like to start off by talking about the Hmong experience and their perspective on immigration as a political issue. In a lot of the interviews we conducted, there was, there was frequent mentioning of the U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. The Hmong people were recruited by the CIA <coughs> to work with the U.S. government in the Vietnam War, and because of this, the Hmong people were no longer safe in Laos and were seen as enemies. Um, in result, the U.S. provided Hmong people to come to the, an opportunity to come to the U.S., and this is seen as a historical political issue. It was also mentioned in the Hmong community that they wanted a political leader of some sort of political representation in their community. And that is seen as a current political issue. And here is a quote from an individual from the Hmong population about that. Dai To became the first Hmong member of the board of St. Paul City Council in Frogtown. So even those small political changes help because once each community has a member to represent them at higher levels, that is how changes are going to start. They are the ones that will work on policies and make a difference for the community. Moving on to the Latino experience, there was um, a reoccurring theme of rejecting immigration policy, particularly deportation, and here are some quotes about that. I don't think undocumented immigrants need to be deported. They are not doing anything wrong. They need to be given more options. It affects their family. U.S. policy should change. Latino immigrants do also pay taxes. They are not doing anything illegal. They are just trying to find good work. The government could do other things besides deportation. Give them job opportunities. The, in the Latino population, they were saying there are other things to do besides deporting individuals, and that is giving them more opportunities, such as more work. And in the Somali experience, there was um, th that similar uh, reoccurring theme, the, um, but particularly in Arizona law. And here's a quote from that. The Arizona law is super racist. A lot of immigration laws, I don't see them as a good thing. I don't see them in, I see them in a bad light. Some of the immigration laws are for people who are illegal immigrants. Laws against illegal immigrants, I don't like just because of the fact that they are people who are trying to change their lives, lives who are coming to a new place. Another similar um, 
similarity between two groups was the Hmong and Somali experience, and they saw the pathway to citizenship as a political issue, and here's a quote on that. The U.S. citizenship test is ridiculous. They ask you 100 questions, and they ask about U.S. history. The question they included was, who was the first president? What is the Bill of Rights? What is the constitutional amendment? What is the difference between the judicial and executive branch? What are the 13 colonies? Who is the senator of the state right now, and who is the president? What's funny is when my husband had to take this test as well, he took the questions and asked some of his college friends at Carleton. Most of them failed. We studied, we studied this in class, and we noticed that there were barriers against immigrants when it came to obtaining a citizenship in the United States. And from all the interviews we conducted, it was seen as apparent that immigration is a political issue. And in your handout, under immigration as a political issue, there's a quote that I will end it with. Immigration has become a very powerful and dangerous tool that has been used by this country, by politicians, news, etc. It's been used to oppress communities in particular. It has been used to deny access to resources, education, and prosperity based on color of skin, where you were born, your accent, based on many other things. Immigration has been used for political, economic, and social power. When I think of issues of documentation, I know there are instances where people aren't even considered to exist, and they would have to live in paranoia. Overall, the issue of immigration is a political I would like to turn it over to Malls, who will be talking about the challenges of adapting to the U.S. and preparing to immigration. to the U.S. as well as similarities and differences across groups. First, within the challenges of adapting to the United States, we found three themes overarching each experience, social, economic, and political. And I'll start off talking about the main themes that we found with social adaptation. One of the main themes we found was language. Using different language every day and difficulties with balancing multiple languages. ESL classes, accent and dialect. Another theme we found was just general adjustments to the US. The different cultural expectations, life here is more routine, all about laws and regulations, and just general moving adjustments. Another theme was racism. At school, adults favoring and prioritizing white students, the common phrase that we hear, this is America, assuming ethnicity and language, and feelings of teachers never taking them seriously and I will leave you with a quote for social adaptation. My dream has changed. My dream now is to do something where I can introduce myself like this. Hi, my name is, and I am your chef. I just want something where my identity is on paper. So now that we've covered social adaptation, I'll move on to economic adaptation. The main theme with economic adaptation was resources, and talking about working much harder than most, financial aid for college for undocumented students. Social security was huge. You need social, social security to buy or rent a house, get a job, and get a license. All jobs, one of, one of the interviewees reported all jobs have been through hookup or looking the other way, and just general limited employment. And I'll leave you with a quote for economic adaptation. Although America is the land of opportunities, you need money to make these opportunities come true. So now we'll move on to political adaptation, which Seagal covered a lot. And the main theme with this was limitation and barriers. The main example that was given was for test questions, like Seagal talked about, and the myth that immigrants don't pay taxes, which is Karina and Sarah debunked for us. In fact, immigrants do pay taxes. And I will leave you with a quote for political adaptation. When I think about immigration, I do not think that they are going to approve something for us if they do not get any benefits. So now that we've covered challenges in adapting to the US, we'll move to similarities and differences between the Somali, Hmong, and Latino populations. So for general knowledge of other immigrant groups, there was not a lot of knowledge. The groups knew stereotypes or they knew individuals. Some of the similarities that report, were reported from our interviewees were the strong bond between the family and culture, the general struggle of immigration, coming for a better future, opportunities for yourself and for your children, not wanting but having to leave because of war, language barrier, culture shock, and discrimination. 
Some of the differences that were reported was colorism, quoted, the lighter the better, stereotypes making it difficult for Mexicans, which was reported by a Somali individual, Hmong having more opportunities, which was reported by a Latino individual, and Somali, being more ex Somali folks being more accepted because of pity, and that was reported by a Somali individual. They also talked about the different resources available to separate groups and labels, like equating Mexican with illegal. So now that we've learned about immigration experience from those we interviewed, I'm gonna turn it over to Jesse, Cynthia, Caroline, and Cyrus to talk about the service learning. We had the pleasure of contributing 157 hours of community service at three different organizations. Um, for the Somali experience, we went to the Franklin Learning Center. Uh, for the Latino experience, we went to the White House. And for the Hmong experience, we worked at the Jackson Elementary School. And so I'm going to pass it over to Cynthia to talk about the White House. ourselves in the Latino population through um, positions such as uh, being the front desk person at the organization, being a food shelf assistant, and being a fitness and health education assistant. And if you look on the last page on your handout, the mission statement of Wake House says, Children feel safe and included. 
It's unique in its focus on the Hmong community, which is quite large in Singapore. With over 60% of the student population being Asian American, Jackson has tailored its curriculum to this particular group. One of its most highly regarded services is the Hmong Dual Language Program, which incorporates both Hmong and English in the classroom from kindergarten through fifth grade. So we decrease in the amount of of Hmong spoken and increase in the amount of English used. This allows Hmong students not only to become proficient in two languages, but to hold on to a part of culture that people often lose when being assimilated into this country. The school also offers Hmong studies courses which focus on Hmong history and culture, after school programs, and a family center to make the family more a part of the child's educational experience. A downfall of this institution that I have seen is a lack of attention on other student populations. African Americans comprise 27% of the student population, and the school has explicitly said on their website that they want this demographic to be a focus along with the Hmong students, but I have yet to see any incorporation of African American studies of history or culture into their curriculum. Jackson claims to offer two after school services directed toward their African American students and their families, but I was unable to find any detailed information about what the children actually do during this time and how many students actually utilize this service since it is after school and not mandatory. As a volunteer at Jackson, my role has been very limited. The people that usually volunteer at this school are either parents or education majors, of which I am neither. <laughs> I have helped with some reading, writing, and math work, and I've observed some of the Hmong Studies courses. More telling than my time volunteering is the observations I've made. The majority of the teachers I've seen at Jackson are white, which does not reflect the student population in the least. I've only seen Hmong students in the Hmong Studies classrooms, and I've had a similar experience with the Hmong Dual Language Program. It makes sense to offer this service primarily to Hmong students, but my concern is that other populations of students might feel excluded by how intense the focus is on this one group. Jackson is in the unique position to educate students from a variety of backgrounds on Hmong culture, history, and language, and to teach Hmong students about the histories and cultures of other student demographics, but I have not seen this opportunity being acted upon as of yet. When it comes to inclusion and ensuring the success of all of its students, Jackson has a ways to go in not only attaining its goals of incorporating African American studies, but in making every student feel like they are fully a part of this unique educational experience. And now I will turn it over to Cyrus, who will be talking about the Franklin Learning Center. Thank you, Carolyn. Hello, everybody. Um, so located in the lower level of the Franklin Library, the FLC provides adults with the resources to educate themselves. Learners, instructors, and trained volunteers work collaboratively, trusting each other's wisdom and experiences. In partnership with other local organizations, we create a vibrant cross-cultural learning community. At FLC, people are empowered with the, with the knowledge they need to fulfill their professional, family, and community roles. So with that being said, some of the services that are offered at the Franklin Learning Center, the learners are offered, they are able to study reading, writing, math, social studies, and social sciences. Along with this, um, they also get to run through speaking and listening activities, um, computer skills, and they also get to prepare for the GED and US citizenship tests. <laughs> uh, going through some of the demographics of the Franklin Learning Center, Currently, 65% of the women, or 65% of the learners are women. Also, 85% are from Africa, um, and 79% are from Somalia. Um, this is very drastically from when the center opened up in 1988. At that time, um, they mainly worked with U.S. foreign citizens, uh, mainly working for their GED. Also, um, the majority was 58% men, so there's definitely a huge contrast of where they were and where they are now. The impact um, and also some benefits and disadvantages. The center is very good um, from a teaching standpoint. Um, as you can see up here, in 2013 alone, they've had 10 learners who have passed all their GED exams, and then also 81 learners have become US citizens. So the center has a huge positive impact on the whole Franklin community. Um, along with this, it also creates a safe place for the learners to interact with tutors one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it makes the experience of learning a personal matter instead of somebody preaching in front of the classroom. Um, some of the disadvantages, however, that I have noticed at the center 
um, is that it can be a little disorganized at times, um, simply because of the amount of space that's available and also the volunteers that are there. They tend to be a lot more learners than volunteers, so it tends to be a little crowded at times. Um, also, fundings for these type of organizations um, is often limited. This has an effect on tutors um, that are available, translators, um, and also um, the hours of availability that are there. With the hours of availability, the Franklin Learning Center is open during regular business hours, so this does have an effect on individuals who cannot make it in there for family or work. So it does limit who can participate in the programs. And with this being said, I would now like to turn it over to Irving, who will wrap up our presentation by framing the issue of immigration within the sociological theory. Thank you, Cyrus. <clears throat> our overall understanding of immigration this semester has been approached using two sociological perspectives on social problems. These two perspectives, which we all agreed on as a class, take on take two different approaches and they're very distinguishable from each other, which is good to provide a broad, a broad foundation from which to understand immigration given how extensive this issue is. Our first approach that we chose was a uh, critical perspective and this explains immigration as being a social problem that revolves around conflict as the diagram shows. This conflict and is in particularly class conflict and it is, fueled, it is what fuels the problem. The resources are very limited for lower class workers and as, as a result of this conflict emerges. The competition between these lower class workers can be between immigrants and non-immigrants as we've seen throughout history, but it can also be between immigrants themselves. The, the competition between these lower class workers results in the exploitation of these workers by the upper class and these immigrants can be defined as social problems due to the exploitation that comes from the conflict and the competition. An example of this would be immigrants that want to leave their home countries due to the exploitation that they face in their native or home countries. The immigrant wants to leave their worsening situation, but due to the lack of resources, they do not have the legal or convenient means of coming to the U.S. Because of this, illegal or unconventional means are going to be taken to come to the U.S. And once arrived in the U.S., these immigrants find that they are in direct competition for those uh, resources that are very limited with other lower class workers. By keeping resources limited, such as citizenship, upper class can maintain immigrants as in a marginalized and, ex and an excluded spot in, in uh, society all while maintaining access to their labor. Other workers, or even the, the upper class themselves, can define immigrants as being a social problem in an effort to compete with them, as well as to make advances. Our second perspective is uh, social constructionist, and this perspective is much more subjective than the critical perspective. This approach revolves around claims making, and that can include labeling or assigning or constructing definitions so that a situation excuse me, can be defined as a social problem. Uh, demands, interests, and reactions and responses are what revolves around this claims making, as you can see in the diagram. The demands are very group specific, and they determine the labels that are assigned to the situation that eventually becomes defined as a social problem. The interactions, the, I'm sorry, the interests are what is met through assigning these labels and they influence the responses and the reactions that are ultimately created to meet those demands. For example, immigrants have demands that are not being met with the current immigration system. As a result of this, immigrants make claims about the, lab about the current immigration system and they label the current immigration system as being a social problem. As immigrants, they have specific interests, and such as immigration reform, and they attempt to have these interests met through claims making. The idea is that society will react in a way that will benefit <coughs> the immigrants. The same would apply to non-immigrants. If a non-immigrant has a demand that isn't being met, they may make claims against immigrants and label them as being social problems. 
rather than the contextual problem itself. Their interests, such as restricting immigration, is attempted to be met through claims making against immigrants as being a problem. The idea here is that society will react in a way that will that will uh, limit immigrants, even if those claims are based on illegitimate myths, such as the ones Sarah and Karina presented earlier. The contrast between these two perspectives exemplifies how fragmented our understanding is of immigration as a society. There are multiple perspectives from which to approach immigration, and each one does that further exemplifies the complexities of the issue. This just comes to show that if there's something to be done about an issue as complicated as immigration, is that it won't come through one simple solution, and that we must approach it from several different angles.